welcome again to the last part, number three of Bristol Field Theory tutorial. In this part I would like to extend our ideas of octahedral complexes with their typical G-splitting pattern to ML4 complexes. Before we do this, I would like to show you one example of an octahedral complex. We have platinum 4 plus. Platinum 4 plus complex forms an ML6 octahedral complex. So our two questions that we ask always is first how many valence electrons do we have? And second question, where are these valence electrons? Now platinum itself should have 10 valence electrons. So that means 4 plus is not D10 but D6 configuration. Second question, where are these six electrons? Now, from the information that we have an element in the lowest rows of the periodic table and as well a very high charge, we can already conclude from this information that delta O must be big. It must be big independent of the ligand. Even the water ligand will not change this picture because also the metal ion has an influence on the amount of delta O. If we have an element in the lower rows, delta O becomes bigger and in addition if we have a high charge, delta O also becomes bigger. So we can assume this complex is a low spin and the six electrons are all in the lower levels. our idea about energy, crystal field stabilization energy of this compound is six times multiplied minus two over phi delta O. But careful, this is not all. We have three times the case where we have to pair up electrons. That means we have a positive energy and this is three times pairing energy. So the stabilization energy is minus 12 over 5 delta O plus 3 P. Again, delta O and P could be known from spectroscopic data and normally are given in centimeter minus 1. I would like to compare the platinum 4 plus octahedral complex with a platinum 2 plus compound. Platinum 2 plus is the most common form of platinum. Now again, how many valence electrons or D electrons? Now we should have 8 valence electrons instead of 6. And again the questions, where are these electrons? Now from experimental data we know that this, comp this ion forms a ML4 compound, not ML6. Okay, from valence bond theory we can already conclude which geometry this ML4 compound would have. We have the 5D levels. the 4s level and we have the no oh sorry 6s of course one more and the 6p level okay the eight electrons will be low spin again because we have a metal in the lowest row of the periodic table so we have to put the eight electrons together one 5D orbital free. Now we need 
need three auditory. We need four empty orbitals to allow a ligand to coordinate to the ion. In this case, we take one, two, three, four. We make a hybridization between D, S, and 2P orbitals of the metal. And this DSP2 hybrid has the square planar geometry. So for example, a platinum Cl4 2 minus should look something like this. All the, all the atoms are in one plane, in this case perpendicular to the paper. Okay, so where are the electrons? What is the electron configuration for the square planar case? We can look at this starting from the octahedral case, the typical 2 over 3 pattern. Now we take away the ligands which are on the z-axis. So take them slowly out. What will happen with the interactions? Now mostly the D Z square orbital of the metal will be influenced because now the repulsion between the D Z square and these two ligands is removed. That means this orbital will go down a lot in energy when we take away the two ligands. On the other hand, the x square minus y square orbital now is the only one that has a direct contact with the four remaining ligands. That means this orbital will go up in energy. Okay, what happens with the group of the three? We can imagine that the orbitals who have a, that have a z component like xz and yz they also experience less repulsion and go down only a little bit, not so much. On the other hand, the xy, as in the balance, should go up. So we end up with an electron scheme, energy scheme like this. We have four low-lying orbitals and one that is very high in energy, the xy minus, minus y, y square. Now what had been the delta O before, we find this energy difference, but of course it's no longer delta O, but the energy gap that causes light to be absorbed is now between these two orbitals. Okay, when we look at this, diagram we can conclude that there is nothing like high spin here. The electrons have no choice, they will be paired up together. No electron will go to this high level by itself, only under the influence of light energy. And second, we can see that this diagram is especially suited, suited for D8 configuration. If we have eight electrons, then we can just fill up the low-lying orbitals and one is empty. And this is what we find in reality. The D8 complexes, mostly from the nickel group, they all are square planar. Exceptions will follow. How about the energy of light that will be absorbed? Now we can imagine a light energy will cause one or two electrons to go from here to here. But now careful, now we get a more complex spectrum because now electrons could go as well from this level up to the empty one and as well from the lowest level up to the empty one. So we have 
a lot of choice between electron transitions and as a consequence we get much more complex UV vis spectra for this square planar configuration. Okay, we come to the last case of geometry. It's also possible that a metal ion has a tetrahedral configuration of ligands. For example, tetrachloronicalate. It looks something like this. Nickel has a DA configuration. How about the energy levels in this compound? This is a little bit difficult to see, but when I show you this drawing, maybe we get a little bit an idea what's going on with the repulsions between metal and ligands. In the tetrahedral case, the ligands approach the metal always in between the axes in between the axes. So opposite from octahedral, where the ligands come on the XYZ axis to the metal here, they are in between. And in between the axis are which orbitals? In between the axis are the group of three x, y, x, z and y, z. So this will go up in energy opposite to the octahedral case and the two remaining z square and x square minus y square on the other hand will go down. So we find the inverse electron configuration then for octahedral complexes 2 over 5, 3 over 5 and the whole energy gap is called not delta O but delta T for a tetrahedral. And we can know also that delta T is much lower than the corresponding delta O. Delta T is only about one half of delta O. And that means that tetrahedral compounds always, they have always high spin configuration. So for D8, that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We get a high spin configuration. Well, in D8 case, there is not much other choice, but if you have less electrons, you should remember we always occupy all levels evenly in the diagram. So now we can compare all our geometries in the middle, the well-known ML6 octahedral case. If we go to the right, then even here is even more extreme in the drawing. The Z square goes down in energy a lot, in this case even below the x, y and x, the x, z and y, z. And the x square minus y square orbital will be in high energy case, will be in high energy. So compared to the octahedral, the delta O would be between the two single orbitals that you see here. On the other hand, if we go from octahedral to tetrahedral, the image switches, becomes inverse, and the energy gap becomes much lower. Again, with the consequence that tetrahedral compounds always are high spin. So that's all for today. Thanks for watching and please do not miss the next part, which will be about ligand field theory, which is mostly MO theory. Thank you very much and good luck.